Thanks, Monica. Cheers. So I want to start by sharing a story with you. When I first started out my HR career, um, I was full of bright ideas and, you know, thought these were really great. And I wanted to get people involved with them. And I would go to lots of colleagues, whether they're seniors in a board or others in a different part of the business and say, hey, I've got a great idea. Why don't we do this? And I found at the beginning of my career that I think I was not getting very far with these suggestions and these ideas, but yet other colleagues who had been in HR for a bit longer were doing much better. They were getting people to work with them collaboratively all over the place. And it made me stop and think, actually, what is going on? What's happening with my practice here? Why are my colleagues doing better at securing all these resources and extra uh, funding to do this, uh, these great activities? And the moment of the thought of, well, what's the magic ingredients in this space that enables them to do something that I was hoping that I could do myself because I'd go armed with facts and figures and the latest research but there was something missing in that space and what that was was the gentle art of persuasion and that's what I'm going to cover today with you. I'm going to cover off how persuasion in HR works and I look at the CIPD profession map uh, what is persuasion? Creating the conditions that we need for yes. Uh, what is reciprocity? And does really knowing and caring make us weak? And is the Jedi mind trick just fiction? So I want us to touch on the CIPD profession map for a moment here because um, persuasion is a key facet of all good HR practitioners. And our core behavior in the profession map is around having the courage to speak up and to be able to skillfully influence others to gain buy-in. And that's predominantly what HR is. We have lots of great intentions, some of them around employment law, some of them around employee benefits, but we can't do these in isolation. So we need to get our um, colleagues, be it in finance, or in um, another project team or in comms to help work with us to do these things. Uh, so it's a really key a really key skill to have. So before I go too far, I'm just going to be stopping throughout to open up questions for colleagues. I know we can't all chat on the, on the uh, presentation, so. Just before we go any further, do, does anyone have any questions on the presentation before we move on to the next part? Um, I think the chat is so far clear. Just Great many uh, many comments. Uh, I'm glad I'm finally here. So uh, I've just messaged everyone once again, apologizing for the technical issues, but so far everything is perfectly clearly. Great stuff. Okay. Um, so what is persuasion? And there's lots of different views on this, but I want to take us back um, to what's the dictionary definition of persuasion. Well, the dictionary said persuasion is the act of persuading someone to do something or to getting them to believe something is true. But for us in HR, it's about persuading others to do something for us, getting them to, to believe in what we want to do. But what I'd like us to do for, for 10 minutes, uh, and Monica's gonna talk about the uh, breakout rules that you're gonna go into breakout rooms, is for 10 minutes in groups, I'd like you to um, discuss your experiences when someone has persuaded you to do something you initially were resistant or didn't want to do. And there are three things I'd like you to cover off in your talk, or your discussion, and that is, what did that person say to persuade you? Uh, how did you feel after you agreed? And how did you feel about that person? And within your group, if you can nominate someone who can input the observations back into the chat bar, um, we'll cover those off after we, after we come out back out of the break. So I'll hand over to Monica, uh, who will lead you into the breakout session. Oh, we still have a couple who stayed here with us. Well, then they can stay. They, well, it's they can. It is, of course, optional yeah. to join breakout <laughs> sessions, indeed. They can always network with us. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Uh, Monica, while we're waiting for those colleagues, um, yes. I just noticed that my screen share is on 
one terminal on the other side over here. So I'm having to desperately look over on that side. I can't. Oh, get that's it fine. <laughs> that's absolutely fine. Yeah. So the colleagues that are uh, with us at the moment, can they talk to us? Or, uh... um, I can allow them to uh, unmute themselves. Yes. So I will put that one temporarily okay. and then I will disable it for the rest of the session. But I think we can definitely trust our attendees tonight. So I have yes. enabled. Uh, our attendees to unmute themselves and potentially put on their video as well. So whoever stayed here with us and doesn't want to join the breakout session, you are in luck as you have got Lee for yourself. So you can ask any question. Well, hello, everybody. Um, do feel free if you want to chip in and answer some questions on this. I'll not often get a chance to do this remotely. So um, if anyone has any observations about persuasion, then I'm really keen to hear what um, what your views are or experiences in fact indeed and we've got a couple who came back uh camilla williams johnson you were the only one in the room the other three didn't didn't come and join you and emily same with you were the only per, only person feel free to unmute yourself you have got the uh option to do so and you can ask lee any questions you'd like or you can put them in the chat and i can read them out yeah okay. Hi, Lee. This Delphina, is hello. Hi. Hi, Monica. Did you hear Hi. someone else than just me? <laughs> I was just going to ask, actually, and I'm sorry I joined a bit late. I don't know if you may have covered it, but um, just with regards to persuasion and influencing and how would we perhaps distinguish the two? Oh, so influencing is a really good question. Now, is that influencing in terms of being thought leadership or is that influencing others in your works in your workspace or network through the things you say i, I i'm thinking more the latter or um yeah but, uh, so yes I, it's a really good question actually and i think some of it is it's less about actually getting people to do anything it's about setting out as a role model um about leading classically leading by example you know, what's your practice when you show up? Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting one. I, I, I think my practice is, is probably more about influencing, really, in the workspace. Yes, I have my teams that work for me, um, but they're doing, doing a, you know, producing things or working on things. But there's a piece there about influencing by, you know, I will happily go into that space and say, well, this is what I'm doing over here and, and talk about the, uh, these things and talk about the learning I've found out or new practice. Um, and I think that it's a non, uh, it's a non sort of directive approach to it for me. And um, I suppose also the influencing there, I think is, is, is raising up my, my team and my, my colleagues mm -hmm. um, and saying, you know, holding them up and saying that these are great things they've been doing, encouraging people to, to open up and share their successes. And that's, for me, is part of the influencing process. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Wonderful. We have a question from Emily. Um, hello, Lee. Emily says, I am making, <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to be looking sideways as well, so I've got it on the other screen. Um, so Emily says, I am making a business proposal at work in which I would benefit from further development at a cost. My response back has been business need. How can I persuade um, or develop or develop my argument to support my case? Mm, Emily, it sounds to me, and this sounds like an agony arm section here, but it sounds to me like the com there's conversations aren't actually happening on a one-to-one -one basis at the moment. Um, forgive me if I'm wrong. Uh, it sounds to me like you might be put presenting in a factual way through papers, emails. Um, I've I experienced that. That's that's the biggest problem I had. I had these great things put it on email, um, but there's nothing better. Than, than scheduling a little bit of time with someone and talking these things through. And we'll cover it later on about reciprocity. Uh, I'm gonna try and get through that word very quickly because it's a bit of a tongue twister, but reciprocity is possibly where you might want to be thinking about how do you take your idea from paper into the reality? And there's a bridge there and that bridge is about human connection and transaction. Uh, a lot of the time, 
you want to be trying to make a connection on whether your idea is actually going to be beneficial for others in the wider network, where the finance might benefit, for instance, in you developing some new training modules. Um, so there's a kickback there. You know, you might be spending money, but it's a, it's a spend to save measure in the long term. Wonderful. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lee. So that was for Emily. And I have got a question from Emily. <laughs> so, yeah, yes. Um, and Emily is asking, so speaking of influencing, how are you making sure to influence people without being too manipulative? Oh, that's a very good point, actually. You put on a spot there. <laughs> uh, it, it, it is. Um, and I, I think from my own practice, and this is what it's all about, is um, I, I don't, I do not um, manipulate people. Um, I try and find common ground. That's where I ensure that I have the right outcomes. If I think common ground is a much stronger basis to have. Um, power play, um, protecting your portfolios, all those things, people do that. Um, but for me, I'm looking for common interest. And I think that altruistic driver uh, ensures that I, I, I move away from manipulation um, because everything's done in a collaborative space for me. HR is about collaboration. Um, yes, certainly some people will try and manipulate in a situation um, and probably, you know, it's beneficial for them in that way of working. But by having a human connection with people, um, that tends to bring the gravity back to what is the shared social idea I'm trying to do. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lee. Well, we have got about 20 seconds before the breakout sessions. The time, the 10 minutes that we've set up are going to be gone and then there'll be 30 second uh, countdown for everybody to come back in so I'm going to just quickly pick one more question that you can talk through Lee yeah. there is one which is linked to Ministry of Defense I will probably put that one on a side because I'm not really sure into what level of into what level of details you can actually go into so I'll pick one here and it says um, how can you get the buy-in of influential leaders at work to get your ideas through right okay um well, I, I don't want to spoil too much in the talk, but we'll certainly cover that there. Um, Brilliant. That's good. <laughs> yeah. um, but there's, there's ways to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I Wonderful. Hope ways. These are my, my ways of doing it. So they might work and why not for you. Brilliant. Some people are back in and they're on their camera. Yes, well. they are. So the breakout sessions have closed and we're just waiting for everybody to join us back in. And I can see the numbers going up. I think just waiting for a few more. I think we have got majority of them back in. Yeah, we are over the 150 mark. So we definitely have them back in and few people are still joining. So Lee, over to you. We can move on with the presentation. Okay, so what I'd like to do is, is hear some of those, those, um, those comments during the next uh, part, next uh, break we'll have in about a few minutes. So Monica, you and Terry, I'll be grateful for your help there. Um, okay, so. I wanted to touch on, on the history of, um, of persuasion, and it goes back thousands of years. And I think um, Aristotle, who was a really cool Greek dude, uh, hence sunglasses, captured it when he was talking about um, persuasion through his teachings on rhetoric. And he said that someone who was persuasive has three critical elements. That's ethos, that's the character and credibility of the speaker. Uh, logos, which is the words or reasons, the strength of argument that's being used. And finally, pathos, which is the communicator's ability to emotionally move the audience, uh, trying to appeal to the, the, um, the, the audiences or persons and emotions when they talk about um, a particular topic and to move them into a position of persuasion. Um, so, I guess the next part on this, though, is about creating the conditions for... It's creating the conditions for yes. Um, if we fast forward 2000 odd years, we come to a gentleman called Robert Cialdini, who um, came up with the six principles for persuasion, which are reciprocity, scarcity, authority, consistency or commitment, liking and consensus. Now, these principles are actually uh, driven out of 
sales techniques, but they do have a bearing in the wider landscape, particularly in HR. Um, I'm going to cover them all, but mine is scarcity, and that's because in sales, scarcity is something that people try and drive so that people will be uh, keener to buy their product because it could be going out of uh, production or there's less of it around. But in HR, that's, that's morally not where we, we work. Um, so if I move on to uh, reciprocity. Now, reciprocity is, in its most fundamental form, is um, the social norm of responding to a positive action with another positive action. So rewarding kind actions, in effect. Um, and there was, so we'll skip on to the group chat, or to the, the breakout in the, uh, later on. But there was a great experiment done in the 1970s in the US um, by a sociologist called Philip Kunz. And he decided he wanted to test how does reciprocity really work? So he mailed out 600 um, Christmas cards with a note for himself and a picture of his family to 600 randomly selected people that he never met before. And he then waited to see what would happen. And shortly afterwards in the Christmas season, he started to get a number of cards coming in uh, with responses to his Christmas card. So out of the 600 that came in, he, he re received over 200 replies. So why were so many people who were complete strangers keen to uh, respond back? Well, Kunz had done something. He'd actually sent a full full note uh, during the holiday season to many, you know, many recipients. And strangely, they felt obliged to attend the favor. And so he got Christmas cards um, and possibly photographs and little notes as well to a complete stranger. Um, so this is the rule of reciprocity at work in this space. If we go um, on to another experiment or case study, this is done by Cialdini himself. Um, and it's a case study where uh, he um, researched how much waiters were being tipped. And he noticed that if a waiter gave a diner a mint, they will get a, a, an increase of at least 3% in the tips they receive. However, if they gave two mints, they get 14% increase in their tips. Now, particularly in America, tips are very big. But what would happen if the waiter just gave one mint and then walked away, but then quickly came back and gave another mint? Now, you might think, well, possibly, um, they'd just get 14%. But interestingly, Caldini discovered that tips increased to 23% just from that, that moment returning and giving back another mint. Uh, so what have we learned from this? Well, um, it's a power of unexpected gifts. It's also because the waiter included in that, for you special people, I'm going to give you this extra mint. So it means that they felt very much uh, treated uniquely and favorably by that waiter. So as a result of that, on average, they got a 23% increase in tips. So I'm going to stop now for two things and stop for questions and also for um, some of the comments that were in the chat uh, following our last breakout. So Monica, if you've got anything there, it'd be lovely to hear. Yep. So I'm looking at the chat. Um, so any takeaway from the uh, from the breakout sessions would be wonderful if you would like to share these with us. And I would like to encourage you to use the chat function for this one, because I can imagine we will have a flurry of them coming in. Um, so whilst we do wait for them, I'm going to pick some of the questions that we didn't have time for before leave. That's OK. Yep. Wonderful. OK, here we are. Um, Ah, this is actually quite interesting. Um, Emily, again, is asking if you would be happy, Lee, to discuss your experience of when someone has persuaded you to do something you were initially resistant or didn't want to do. Um, uh, yes, I can do. Um, certainly, I think um, apart from my other half is often persuading me to do things. In the work context, certainly, um, I think that there are uh, there've been moments there where um, it's been twofold. It's been persuasion through probably uh, a positive environment, 
Um, and uh, an example that comes to mind for me is uh, regarding a colleague that I was working with and we needed to amend some, um, some of the, the process policy steps in there. And we, we walked walk through it and they explained to me what they wanted to do. And I, initially I was resistant because, you know, it was going to be impinging on more work for me. But actually, the way they presented it to me, the way they explained where the benefit is in the long term, and that was the key thing for me, it was the benefit that it was beyond just, oh, it's a short term inconvenience. Um, but I think the way they approached it with me was probably the most impactful piece there. It was quite gentle. Um, uh, it wasn't forthright, but it was quite firm as well. And I, I felt afterwards that the way they did that was a really great demonstration of um, being collaborative. Uh, and it was a great role model experience as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Lee. And now we have got all the uh, um, all the other comments coming in. So, um, um, Pavisha, I believe, is the, is the right way to pronounce name. So what they've discussed is, is that aggressive style let the feeling bullied and dislike for the persuader okay can you just repeat that first bit again? it's a comment so um oh i've lost it here aggressive style of the person who was persuading uh, someone basically when they adopted uh, aggressive style it led to those person who were being persuaded feeling being bullied mm -hmm. and they obviously developed disliked for the persuader so that was something they were discussing in their group um another group um from Eva, uh, they have discussed situation that someone reminded them when they feel better after doing something they don't want to do that particular time. Plenty of other comments, some of them are quite long. From Jane, uh, the person persuaded by reassurance, giving clear indication of what will happen and instilling confidence, uh, felt nervous but increased in confidence and very happy when task was completed, grateful to the persuader. So it's actually quite a good kudos, aren't they? Yeah, brilliant, yeah. Indeed. And I think for the person who mentioned about the, the experience of being bullied, I would say in that instance that the individual was probably treating that relationship very transactionally and mm -hmm. not thinking about the long-term foundation um, and you know, I, you know, I don't know where you work, but I would say that there's a, there's a point there about maybe calling that out, but mm. that's some great examples. Thank you. Indeed. I have a question from an, uh, from Najija, I believe. Um, hi, Lee. How would you define the difference between influencing and persuasion? Would you say there is a thin line there and do the two combine? Ooh. Um, yes, I think we had, an, um, we had another colleague earlier on talking about that. Yes, uh, influencing is a much more subtle approach. And it tends, from my perspective, tends to be about influencing a wider group of people in a practice, whereupon persuasion is about a targeted um, approach for a particular topic or, or um, agenda item you want to try and take forward in a collaborative space. And I think persuasion is, for me, the, the collaborative versus the nudge the sort of nudge theory behind that so yeah those those two but they are uh there is a thin line sometimes and they do cross over and they can be um very uh, powerful when they do brilliant thank you another question from diane just came in uh please could you provide an example of how you would use reciprocity to persuade at work is it the same as priming the individual slash group Ooh, okay, well, I'll tell you what, we will come on to reciprocity in the talk. So we'll cover a couple of examples in that. Um, but I'm interesting that they use the word priming them. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So there are plenty of comments. So I would actually encourage all of our attendees to read through them whilst we continue with the presentation. Because, of course, I'm mindful of the fact that we have started late and we obviously do not want to eat up into too much of your evening. But great connection so far, great engagement in the chat. So please keep it coming. It's great to see you engage with Lee. And any questions you have got for Lee, please put them in the chat and we will pick them up as and when we will have another of these pauses for your questions. Yeah, I can even possibly answer some of them after the the uh, session and respond back uh, to, to all the audience. Um, Wonderful. Online. Thank you. Thank you. So let's look at those six principles, or in this case, five principles, uh, and we'll talk about authority uh, as the first one here. And that's the idea that people like to follow a credible, knowledgeable expert. Now, that's a distinct difference from leader. 
Um, and this is not about leadership here, this is about experts. And experts are now having their time. This is the sort of age of awareness, age of recognition in that space. Um, and authority, I suppose, when we talk about this, that people tend to respond well. Uh, I think of one person straight away, uh, which is um, Dr. Chris Whitty, um, you know, very uh, mild individual. Um, he was being thrust into the spotlight here, but yet he is, you know, the country's leading authority on COVID and how we're going to be deploying um, the uh, COVID vaccines. And, uh, but yet he's not taking a leadership role here. He's, he's an expert. He's built his, his authority through credibility, through knowledge. Um, but an interesting experiment happened a couple of years ago around authority and, and people, how people perceive it. There's a test there. And it's no, it was noted um, in an experiment done in the UK High Street actually, was that people tend to respond very quickly in a positive way to someone who visually looks like they're um, in a position of authority. And in the experiment they use high visibility jackets and colleagues walking around the high street with them. Um, and this uh, resulted in people establishing through research that people respond to positions of authority or, or responsibility. And interestingly, it makes people, uh, anything that person says, seem more authoritative. Now, in one sense, that's really good. In another sense, it's slightly dangerous, but, uh, but, but the bottom line here really is that by growing the credibility, uh, one can um, uh, do a number of things. And of course, you know, how do you do that? Well, that's about establishing your expertise in the field. And it's about develop, by providing solid information. You know, going on to the stats, the statistics, that's absolutely important here. Knowing about the wider horizons going on when you're talking about your subject so that you can have a position of understanding and authority is really key. And I suppose that demonstrates as well what credibility is as well. A credible uh, authority will know the impacts of what they're proposing, will know what's going on in different sections and know what's coming downstream, for instance, from employment legislation or if there's going to be refinements in budgetary approvals. Um, and also there's a, a key thing here, because this is about being authentic, I suppose, in one sense, is about creating trustworthiness. And, you know, sometimes that could be some uh, admitting there are some flaws, you know, I'm not saying they're completely flawed, but, you know, we're human, so we're fallible. So, you know, let's not hide behind that. I'm very open about that sometimes. I may not have all that information, you know, I might have missed that. And that's where we build collaboration and, and people come in to help and support in that space. Also, one of the, the other ones here, we'll touch on this, is about similarities between you and the other person. Sometimes people find that that is a strong connection for authority. So we talk about now about consistency or commitment. And I love this picture here. This just really strikes at the heart of it. People like to be consistent with the things they have previously said or done. And this, this cartoon is absolutely excellent in terms of describing that um, this gentleman has been um, uh, you know, with a 30 year mortgage, a five year car lease and a lifetime gym membership, but yet he's afraid of commitment. So people don't like when other people are not consistent in what they're doing. And that's a very key principle around persuasion is the consistency of the message. Um, and I think that um, it's, it's really key here in this space around the attitude and actions and words that you use, um, particularly when you're leading someone to make commitment with you. And that could be, you know, going on record or taking a stand on a position. Um, people tend to want to be consistent uh, when, they, when they do these things, particularly on the later on when they've made a commitment to do something. So commitment has, doesn't have to be big, particularly in persuasion. Um, at the outset, you're forming a relationship, it can be small and it can be about um, just a small commitment from someone uh, that can springboard you on later on as you, you work with them in a to and fro position. Um, and you might then decide to lead into uh, a slightly bigger ask, or they might come with a bigger ask. So, you know, commitment is sometimes leading on to springboard of, of bigger joint commitment with each other. 
and consensus. Um, this is a really key one. I think we've all heard this around the, the boardroom at some point, and it's when people are uncertain about a proposition that you might be putting forward, and they look to others for what actions and behaviours they're taking. And normally I, I, I hear is what are other, other business elements doing, what are other departments doing, um, and reality, who's on board and what are they up to? You know, people want to stay ahead of the curve, or at least be in the pack doing the same thing. They don't want to be left behind, um, which is really, really important here. So somewhere around consistent consensus is really important to establish in that, that space, particularly if you're looking to persuade someone to take on an idea you think is really important, uh, if it's going to be beneficial for the business and staff. And liking. Um, like it or hate it, it's, it's a primordial social thing that we, we, we do. It goes back thousands of years. Um, people prefer to say yes to those that they like. And um, in the civil service, we spend a huge amount of time working on what we call unconscious bias so that we can, you know, we can address that. But people naturally will be persuaded by someone they, they, more they, they like. And it's, it's one of the, the challenges that we have in this space. But I think by looking at how we approach things and coming across as credible, that helps us to create that likability in a professional sense. Um, certainly, um, there, are, there is lots of research about um, liking or bias, um, and sometimes it, it's beneficial, sometimes it's not, and I think for a majority of times, um, it's not as factual based as it should be. Um, but certainly there's, there's a, an, um, a recognition here that if you're trying to persuade, um, one of the elements there around uh, liking is going to influence some of that. And, but that can be addressed, as I said earlier on, about credibility and authority. But my final message on this piece about the six principles is please don't be a Swiss Tony, don't be a car salesman and try and sell people everything under the sun from learning these principles. Um, that's not authentic and it's certainly not how we should be doing business here. Um, you know, a, a, a good approach to this is about being genuine in your, your, your uh, practice with people. So I'm going to stop there just for some questions that might be on, uh, on the group. And there are quite a few. <laughs> they did come. Wonderful. Right. So thank you so much. Um, we will start with uh, this question. I've collated them chronologically, so I will go through them this way. Lee, can you please make a suggestion of how to use persuasion in intercultural situations? Some cultures seem to be, seems to need praise, personal flattery uh, to even begin the conversation. So what suggestions would you have when you are trying to persuade someone who is com from completely different culture? Oh, that's a great question, actually. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's very difficult sometimes to sense what is the most appropriate thing to do in that space. Um, there's no harm in actually doing a little bit of research, I'd say. Um, there are oriental um, uh, cultures are less about the outward gushing appreciation of someone um, and then if you think about maybe Arab, Arab countries and their cultures they're all about the the standing in the individual praise before going into anything and also conscious about losing face um, so those are just a couple of things there. And I suppose if you're dealing with European colleagues, you know, dependent on the nationality, there'll be certain traits. I, I think there's no firm answer apart from to do a bit of research and understand. But, um, but one of the, the cautionary notes there is, you know, be genuine here. Don't, don't lavish um, them with, with compliments because, you know, even the person who might like that most will will sense very quickly if that's disingenuous and you really should be a genuine comment, you know, liking something they've done, praising some of the work they've done, how the impact of that is, as opposed to praising the individual. And that's the key thing here. Praising something they've done is probably the biggest compliment you can do compared to praising the person as a whole. Wonderful. Thank you, Lee. Another question. Is evidence-based argument key to successful persuasion? 
or is it equivalent to establishing authority or dominance while persuading? I would say it's it's the, the former. Um, I, I wholeheartedly believe in evidence based uh, decision making and evidence to, um, to to back up any approach there. Um, I'm quite conscious that dominating is the least of my uh, preferences in that space, and I certainly wouldn't practice that. But it's worthwhile to have that that in the back pocket, to have that conversation, and to bring that into play. If there is a misnomer or misunderstanding in the conversation, you can say, actually, you know, we've looked at this, this is what's happened. And it really does play out because if you take this through, it's going to be really helpful for your part of the business or for the wider uh, organization or stem the flow of people leaving because of a bad experience working with the company. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions if there's anyone? Yeah. There are plenty. Um, I'll pick a few. This one, uh, Lee, what do you think is the most favorable strategy when persuading in a politically charged environment? Oh, okay. Well, my favorable strategy actually is to have one to ones. It's, it's not to do it in the room because there's so many dissent, um, divergent opinions. It's actually to do the work and have a conversation with someone um, in the margins. And, and the reason for that is that um, standing and impression in a big environment, it's really difficult when actually they might have their own worry or concern. And if you're looking to, to take something forward with them, having creating that safe space for them to have that conversation with you um, is much more effective. And it really does win hearts and minds in that sense, because you can have a conversation with them and it's it's and and then they can you can sort of unearth some of the problems and address them with them, and I think then you can take that back into the room. I know there's no harm in having a number of those conversations because each person will have unique perspectives, so you'll want to address that, and that can then, that can help you in a politically politically charged situation. Thank you, Lee. Do we have time for one more before um, we move on, or two? <laughs> Uh, well, I'd say we maybe we'll have uh, come back to this. So I've still got a Fine. few more slides to go. <laughs> I um, will collate all of them so we can move on and then we'll revisit them. Thank you, Lee. Loving the questions. They're, they're brilliant questions. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. So my practice, and this is the bit I wanted to share with you. We've talked about the academic research. We've talked about the ancient Greeks. We've talked about how we can get tips if we were waiters or waitresses. Now, this, I would really like to cover my part about my practice in this space. Um, and for me, we, we've talked a lot about all the great things about strategies and, you know, is influence and persuasion the same thing? But there's a, there's a big piece in the middle here. And this is the piece that when I thought back to my time when I was first thinking, oh, what's happening? Why aren't people so good at this and I'm not? When I first started out, it's because something called presence. And presence isn't just, um, just to clarify, this is not Christmas presents or birthday presents, because that, that would be bribery, but this is about your presence in the conversation, your presence in the room, um, how you show up. And this is possibly the most important thing, but it's never really spoken about when you look at all the areas of persuasion and coaching and how do you show up in that space. Um, now, I love the teachings of uh, Patsy Rodenberg, who is a um, voice and uh, acting teacher in, well, she was in the uh, Royal School of Arts and also she works in America. And she developed the, the circles of, of, of presence and I just want to touch on them for a few minutes. Um, so there are three circles, which is a nice, nice number. Um, and I want to touch on the first and the third for, to, to, to cover off and we'll go to the second one afterwards. So the first circle, and this is about individual's presence here, is an introversion. It's about when your focus is on, about, is on you um, and it's about um, and the sort of physical manifestations of that are averted gaze, the body language is collapsed, so you're leaning forward, you're looking down. Uh, all of those things lead to disconnection with others in that space. So if, and you can probably think of a few moments in your life where you've encountered someone who's maybe got a rather flat tone voice, doesn't have any intonation or um, excitement in there. 
Um, and you might think, and actually I'll ask you to do this after the talk as well, next time you're walking down the street, um, just have a look, see if the people that you pass, have a look at them and see if any of them avert their gaze, they look down, they look to the left, they look to the right while you're looking forward. If you do spot that, those people are what we are called in the first circle, the introversion, who are not going to connect. Um, another example of that you might see is someone with their headphones on, they're in their own world, that's actually first circle. Um, but if you move to third circle, um, and this is, this is really um, the, the, the outward projection of an individual, and I, the, the great person I can think of in this space, and luckily they've just left the White House. Um, but it's, it's Donald Trump is a clear example where someone who's very aggressive, who constantly broadcasts, but isn't in a two-way conversation. Um, it's not specific to, to anyone in particular, it's just to everybody. Uh, and when they speak, they're absorbing the space. They're not ready to, to receive information back. Um, and that's the third circle of presence. Um, but that can happen in other space. That can happen in a, in a talk, uh, be it in a, a business meeting or something like that. You will see people who are on broadcast. But if we go to second circle, which is the optimum position that anyone should be in, if you want to have a really meaningful connection, this is about being in an aware, uh, an aware state, knowing uh, and listening and talking and having a conversation in a two-way uh, process. It's about focusing just outside yourself, but speaking with effect to others. Um, children are fantastic at being in second circle. They're very focused around what they're doing. They'll ask lots of inquisitive questions. Um, in fact, animals are very, another great one. If you ever see dogs in a park and they're, they're looking at their owners and the owner's got the ball or the stick and they're absolutely focused on their owner, that is second circle. That is where they've got an absolute connection with the individual. And as when you're looking to, um, you know, to gently persuade someone, you've got to be mindful of where you present yourself, which energy you are in. Are you in first or third? You're guaranteed not to have a connection. But if you're in second, then you are going to create a connection. And that's where it can be quite deep and meaningful. Um, but if you get an opportunity, do have a look at Patty Rodenberg's uh, work. I've got some resources at the end of the uh, presentation on that that uh, you can you can look further into. So just now going to go into a quick uh, group breakout. Um, this will be the final one for the evening. Uh, and what I'd like you to do in your groups after following Monica's instructions again is to think about um, presence. Um, what does it mean to you? What does it mean being present? Um, how do you create your presence when you're in the room, when you're talking one-to-one -one or when you're talking to a board or colleagues? And how do you feel others respond to this when you're in that state? And again, if you can nominate someone from your group to have um, a, a virtual pen and, and type out some of those comments ready to go into the chat bar, we'll pick them up, up afterwards. Okay, over to you, Monica. Wonderful. Thank you. So the same principle as the first time around, you will be moved into a virtual breakout session. I have made them slightly larger. So just in case there are a couple of technical issues and if you attendees stay with us again, we don't end up with someone being in the room alone. So I've made them a little bit bigger. You will have again 10 minutes and at the end of the 10 minutes, you will get a 30 second countdown uh, to return back to us and not to get cut off in the middle of a sentence. Once again, please include everybody, be respectful of each other's uh, opinions and I look forward to see you back in about 10 minutes time. I think we have got everybody back now. So I hope you have found the second breakout session working slightly better than the first. <laughs> there were a good handful of attendees who stayed with me in the main room. So we had a we had a, just a little bit of a, a engagement going on as well. But the vast majority of our attendees have been in the breakout sessions. But I'm going to hand back over to Lee, who will be taking us through the rest of the presentation. Lee, you are currently muted. There we go. That's Great. it. You're uh, doing me. I constantly mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So brilliant, thanks Monica. I'd love to hear those comments uh, a little bit later on when we come to the next question section, so that'd be brilliant. Okay, so I want to talk about this legendary thing called authenticity. And everybody talks about it. It's like the, you know, it's like the holy grail of being a great leader. Um, but yet, there's so much out there. And I, I did a quick Google search before we came on today to make sure the numbers haven't gone up or down at the stock exchange. And when I typed in authenticity, there are over 261 million results for it. So it's a very well documented, written about area. So I thought, okay, I want to just get down a little bit further into the into the detail here. So I typed in leadership, authentic leadership. And again, I got 97 million results that came back on that search on that search phrase. Um, but I'm not here to talk about leadership, I'm not here to talk about, you know, authentic um, other things. I'm here about to talk about my authenticity in my practice. And this is actually about um, how I show compassion and care on the subject I'm talking about. So this is about the emotional side, and it could be also body language as well. Um, I'm not the one to shy away from throwing my hands in the air to talk, because I'm, it's you know it's an expression of passion about the subject I'm, I'm, I'm delivering to someone or talking about. Um, it's also about the authenticity, the belief of what you're saying, and as often you can hear, you meet these people and they're very, very, flat toned about what they're talking about. There doesn't seem to be much spark. Do you come away asking yourself, does that person actually believe in their own product or what they're doing? Um, that belief does translate into how you say things and that, that's where people can be brought on that journey with you. Um, also, um, it does require extra work. Be ready to, to respond. And, you know, I always say when we're in that space. I, I, I welcome people who ask questions, who challenge me, and you know, it gives me an opportunity, and I mean that in a real sense, to speak a little bit longer on the subject and address people's concerns. Um, and, and those are some of the parts of the practice that I do in that being authentic. It's, it's, you know, but authenticity links back to liking. We've talked about the, the six principles by Cialdini. Um, People are, you know, really relate to those who are authentic and have passion for a cause. I'm not saying we're all going to be evangelical, but, you know, in, in, in this space, it's certainly something that I practice is about showing how, you know, I, I believe in what I'm taking forward. And I think that would be, you know, the right approach for, for being altruistic in this space. Um, Monica, I think we've got a question slot here. I wonder if it would be worthwhile just dipping into those those comments in the chat room. I had a great time with my group and I'm hoping everyone else had a lovely time as well. So I'd love to hear maybe three of those comments, just noting the time. Wonderful. So um, I have picked one that's quite a long comment from a group and um, it's mentioning that they have discussed what makes you feel you are being listened to, such as uh, having a direct eye contact, putting your phone down as such, and also how do they um, make themselves feel present in the current moment? Uh, what are they uh, What are they wearing? What colors they are wearing? Is it obviously business attire, etc.? And the other comment that they were discussing, what is the tone of voice the influencer is using and what speed they are talking at the person they are trying to influence. Absolutely. That's a lot of comments in one. Yeah, a lot of technical questions there. Um, gosh, and you'll have, maybe have to remind me here. Um, I, I, a colleague I worked with a while ago said something that was really impactful to me. And they said, um, you can wear what you want, but don't let your clothes be louder than the message that you give. Um, and I think that's absolutely the thing I take away from that is that you, you know, within reason, wherever you work, whatever the style is, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a suit, a shirt, a, a three piece, twin set, whatever you want to call it. Um, it. It's mainly about the message. Sometimes the credibility is people are still stuck on does that person wear a blazer into the office or are they wearing you know, um, a, a, an office jacket of some sort, or, you know, what they turn up in jeans and runners. Um, I don't think there's a golden answer to that one. Uh, I think in terms of tempo and flow, um, 
statistically speaking, people are able to absorb about 150 words a minute. I'm not saying you should count every single word in a minute you use, um, but a calm, a calm uh, approach to it. You know, if you speak too fast, which I can be guilty of because I'm so enthusiastic or something, people can lose part of that message. Um, so you just have to find your own natural rhythm. But sometimes, you know, if you're a bit nervous about this, why don't you practice? Why don't you practice just running through what you think might be the conversation points you want to cover? Um, Monica, did I capture everything or was there a piece there I missed? Um, I think you've captured absolutely everything. Um, one thing that came up from another comment, which actually I'm a bit surprised it didn't come up before. I guess it's because we are all getting used to it so much. And that's touching upon the difference of trying to persuade someone face to face and trying to persuade someone in the virtual world that we are in at the moment. Yeah. Um, and it's from Brinda Chanda. And uh, the comment says, being present has been difficult through the current working from home situation. Yeah. Actively listening and showing that you are listening to people in the virtual meeting is, is completely different. What would your comments be on that? How would you say, what are the, are there some specific tips and tricks or things that persuaders should use in the virtual world? Um, yes, uh, there's a couple of things that I do. I mean, I said before uh, on about, you know, making connections with people on the one-to-one -one level, um, before, you know, either in the meeting and then dialing it up afterwards. But if you're in a meeting and it's a one here, I guess for me, um, it's sometimes it's actually encouraging people to, to come into the conversation and, and, you know, without calling them out in a negative way, you know, saying, you know, uh, Monica, you know, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And by saying that I'm being receptive, people start to connect with you. Um, and one of the things I tend to do in that space is to say, well, why don't we take this offline? Let's unpack this together. Um, you know, saying, I want to spend time with you. Um, I know we're all busy. Uh, it doesn't always work for everybody. Sometimes paraphrasing back, making sure I check that you've got the connection, what you're saying there, those are other things to do. Um, so I think, and we'll talk about it later on, sometimes it's about establishing a rapport by knowing the person beyond the transactional. And that's how you you start to create that, that presence and connection to be able to persuade, to find the common ground. Brilliant. A um, few more comments. One, just reiterating what you said with uh, with regards to practicing is from Nayia and she's saying it might sound mad, but sometimes talking to yourself in a mirror is helpful. And I am certainly the person who does that. <laughs> I talk to myself yeah. in a mirror. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. OK, well, I'm going to move on. We'll catch up some of those questions later. But that's really great questions. And never be frightened to talk to yourself in the mirror. It's only when you answer yourself back, do be worried. OK. <laughs> Um, right, so does knowing and caring make us weak? It's a really big debate question here. Um, but as I said earlier on, just a few minutes actually ago, um, for me, it's about getting to know my colleagues beyond that transactional relationship. What do you do? I need that, and therefore I'll ask you. Um, and these things, you know, we're talking about common interests, bonds, knowing about people. When people take a moment to actually look beyond what your role is to who you actually are, that's when you can have a, a shift, a shift in your relationship, a shift in reception, a shift in how that person responds to you as you go forward. And it, and it builds mutual appreciation that you can rely on in the past. But it does take time. It, it means you take time out of your conversation to know that person. Um, and there's a couple of really brilliant um, examples that come to mind. I was working with someone in the army um, and they were moving to up north and I just happened to mention to them, oh, well, that's an area very famous for steam trains. All of a sudden the conversation stopped and we were talking about, and we were talking about trains and swapping stories and all the other things that come with people who are geeky about trains. But what happened that changed our relationship um, they changed it to a more uh, collaborative relationship. We started to work much more. And we would just, you know, can you loan me this? Can you tell me how that works? Or I do the same thing. So it's an example there of finding a common ground. And then does that actually lead you into another space? Um, I've got another colleague who loves horse riding. So again, now I was able to have that conversation with them or another colleague that's spoken about 
how their son's doing up in the university in Scotland. So I, I often, when I speak to them, I check in and see how their, their family's progressing in that space. Um, and, you know, that's a reciprocal arrangement as well, but very impactful. Um, so I've set out some steps and turns here just to sort of give you an idea of how I do it, and people can do it in different ways. Um, certainly I do check in with people um, because that's about showing care about the humanity that we have um, and also reflecting back what was the last thing that was going on for them. We talked about my colleague whose son was in Scotland going to university and a drive up there so checking in with him. Um, what's happening to them now particularly in Covid you know and we talk about that question how do we do it remotely well sometimes it's just about having an honest conversation and say how are things that you know that empathy reflection and listening is really powerful um also maybe share what's happening for you i i think that's you know it's one of those things that people are interested to understand and links back to their experience so they're not in isolation working in covid particularly it can feel quite lonely so having that connection can really build bridges. Um, certainly you want to be mindful of the time you've got. You want to move into the space about setting out what it is you're, you're talking about here. But we talked about how do you get the buy-in influence. Well, if you're asking someone to do something, there's always that key question, what, what's going to be in it for me? What's, what's it going to do for the, you know, to help my department, my area or my organization how will it achieve our goals um, it needs you know you need to be able to connect those things together here um, and of course you know i'll be looking to talk about what what we need to make it happen so if we're going to share resources um, persuade that person to say look you know if we do this then these are the trade-offs that we're both going to get from that um, and of course i think that the final bit here is a bit is telling them how will we get you closer to your goal as well as mine. And I think that's where you start to see the collaboration move into that space. Um, so those are some of the tips I take in that journey when I'm talking to someone. It's not about manipulating, it's about saying, look, there's benefits for us both in here. So finally, is the Jedi mind trick um, real or not? Um, so if it only took data to convince people, Big mistake, it doesn't, it's much more than that. What it is does take is underpin the data, but it is, you need narrative, and you, you need to describe the subject in a very important way. Um, we use words to transport our ideas in our head into the minds of others around us. So you've got to create that shared vision to, to achieve that buy-in. So you've got to think about the positive descriptors that you're going to be using, the compelling words to frame your subject, um, to help realise the benefits for the others in the room as well as yourself. Um, so there are simple phrases to achieve some of that. For instance, you might say to someone, would you be willing to? Tying into the altruistic driver that people have. People are often like, I'm always willing to do things. Um, so, you know, it's using some of that kind of wording. It's not NLP, it's not, you know, um, you know, using ways to manipulate them, but it's about creating the right kind of conversation with the right wording so that you can have a good conversation there. Um, but in conclusion, the answer to whether it's a Jedi mind trick isn't actually that far away from us. You've all possessed the skills uh, to persuade someone, to learn to harness that. And I would say, please, if you do do this, um, whether you adopt your own practice, use it for good, not for evil death stars. Okay, um, may the HR force be with you. Absolutely wonderful there. Um, well, if you do find someone who is a Jedi, I would love to learn those tricks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lee. <laughs> Brilliant. So I do have a couple of questions that I've collated that we didn't have time to go through. Um, I will go through them. And uh, Terry, I'm going to bring you into if I have missed some of them, um, okay. if you have got them on a side, that would be wonderful. So Lee, um, there's a question about I think we're going about 20 minutes back, you were talking about credibility in your presentation. Yeah. And the question asks, how do you build credibility back when it's broken? Oh, now, if that's Gosh, if that's your credibility, that's an interesting one. Um, 
Yeah, I think sometimes it's it's about actually putting in the extra efforts in there. It's some you know if the credibility has been broken because you haven't delivered something, then it's about making those small incremental moves forward to say, I could do this, I can achieve this, this is not big. Give me that opportunity to do that. Um, it's an interesting one. It's very personal with people about when your credibility is being broken. But we all make mistakes, we're human, we're fallible. But we can all come back from that. Um, and we can all, you know, regain where we were before. So I think sometimes it's probably about, you know, taking those small steps to try and rebuild it with someone by demonstrating something to them. Wonderful, thank you, Lee. Um, another question, um, what steps would you take to convince your team of your idea when you are brand new to the team? Oh, yes. Well, actually, that's a really tough situation to be, isn't it? You've got this wonderful idea and everybody's doing the tried and tested method. Um, and as there's a great phrase from a few months back I, I discovered, it's about online learning, I think it's about the best practice of yesterday is not always the best practice of today. Um, if I've got a team and they're resistant, and I have had teams that are resistant in the past, um, I talk it through with them. I say, look, let, let's have that challenging conversation, you know, tell me where you think it's going wrong, but I spin it around and say, well, tell me where you think it's going wrong, what will we need to make it happen? Never come to the party without a proposition, I was told. And I think that is the case here. Frame the conversation as what would you need to have in place to make that a reality? And there's some great examples in the past uh, where people have never been asked that question. And if they had been asked that question, they said, well, if we had this, we'd do it. Brilliant, thank you, Lee. Um, one more question that I have managed to pull out. It's about public sector organizations. Mm -hmm. And this question poses, so public sector organizations have a duty to promote equality. Uh, mm -hmm. Why do they need to be influenced when it is their duty? It's quite a rhetorical question, I would say. Do you want to pick it up, Lee? Uh, oh, it's an interesting one. Um, well, equality is incredibly important. Where I work at the moment, inclusion equality is, is is the primary thing in this space um but to achieve some of the objectives to to, to get to that level playing field um it's it, it, it's interesting that not everybody's on the same page sometimes they've got slightly different views and so to you have to spend time persuading them their priorities are elsewhere um they may have you know lots of staff they may have a reduction in budget and you're coming to them and saying well, we really need you to spend some time on this um, um this this equality training or something like that and so so people tend to come to the that with a no immediate no um and some people step away from it they go, well i tried but that doesn't work but no is always the beginning you need to go back in and say okay i recognize you're saying no to me now but let's have a conversation about this um, sometimes, as I say, it's about rebalancing people's priorities by showing them the, the benefits. And I think it's, it doesn't just stop at um, being the private public sector, it can be the private sector too. Very nicely done. And I know that wasn't an easy question, so well done, Lee. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one just came in from Themistocles. How gendered or otherwise biased do you think the concept of persuasive presence is? And how much is there space to be authentic if someone doesn't fit certain stereotypes? Oh, this is a good one. It's like, you, you know, um, yeah, just because I don't look like the rest of you, uh, that doesn't mean I'm not going to be able to have a value opinion. Um, and yeah, so do you become the chameleon and, and move in that space or do you hang on to your authenticity? Um, as someone who's neurodiverse, um, I think that I, I actually hold on to pride with my, my difference and I keep that's actually key to me. And I think that you should never forsake that. Um, sometimes people will learn to appreciate that. It may not happen straight away, um, but certainly um, it's a fundamental core of yourself and you have to be true to yourself in that space. So don't relinquish it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, those are all the questions I have picked up. Terry, have you picked up any yeah. that might, I might have I've, missed? Yeah, I've, I'm just making sure I'm not on mute. So I've got one that's got 
people by people, how does that fit with diversity and neurodiversity? So, so Terry, can you say that first so, again? Yeah, people by people, how does that fit with diversity stroke neurodiversity? People by people, I haven't heard that phrase before, but um, um, I thought the neurodiversity piece, particularly because neurodiversity isn't just one particular part of, um, it's not like dyslexia, it's autism as well, the dyscalculia. Um, sometimes you have to think about how you're going to approach that some people won't respond uh, as well in that space to the sort of standard approach there. Um, uh, when you're trying to persuade them, particularly if maybe someone has uh, is on the autism spectrum, you know those those normal interactions in social cues will not be picked up with them. Um, but I think what I might say is I would be happy to take a question offline and answer in, with the other one so that I can um, probably do a bit better job on that one. Okay, thank you. I think that's the only other one I've picked up. Okay. I think so, indeed. Well, we are getting loads and loads of comments from from attendees saying absolute wonderful. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, I will call out one from Sanjay saying, Lee Smith, you are a wise man. <laughs> well done. Thank you very much, Sanjay. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> wonderful presentation. You have done really well. So many comments were coming through uh, through the chat saying how great the presentation was. So many really good points. Um, many action points they can take away uh, literally straight away and and use them tomorrow. Um, so great session. On my behalf on CIPD, I am absolutely in awe. Thank you so much. And I will hand back over to Terry to close the session tonight on behalf yeah. of the branch. Yeah, so, so thank you very much everyone for joining us tonight. And thank you Lee for your time in taking um, us through the gentle art of persuasion, which I will definitely put to practice in my role even tomorrow, because I've got to try and persuade my boss if I can take some time off at short notice. So it will hopefully, um, I'll be putting it this tonight into good, to good use. So yeah, once again, thank you very much everyone for attending and um, keep an eye out for all the various events that are taking place, not just in East London and Docklands, but all the other branches some have some really good sessions um, that you can all sort of enjoy and be involved in. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Monica, for your time for hosting the session for us and for Lee. Always thank a you. pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.